The Dreamcast is full of very interesting titles, from the strange and unique anime games that are on the system, to the platformers, to the horrible horror games. It's crazy to see the amount of games on the system, and somehow Sega still dropped the ball compared to the other systems. But I mean, when your competitor's system has Finny the Fish in his dedicated community, it's really hard to compete against that. But with the fall of the Dreamcast happening, a lot of these games are now on a dead console and are just fading to obscurity as days pass. I mean, do kids even know what a pin pin is? I mean, what kind of country do we live in that kids to this day don't have the right to a free copy of Pin Pin Trisalon? Like, what are we doing? Come on, Biden! Support our fucking. <laughs> <laughs> but with 61 Days of Spook still going on, even if Halloween is over, I still have some more gloomy and dark games to talk about, so why not dust off another game with Atlas, having a big part in it? A game that would have been mistaken for Red Steel's inspiration at the time. A game that would make you die of laughter from the voice acting. A game that would be at best a 6 out of 10. Known as Machin X. Now, I covered Machin X before in my gaming aesthetics video, and I still stand by everything I said there with how charming the graphics can be and how awfully charming the VA roles are here, which I know they suck, but I love them. So, no surprise, I would return to this for a full review. While doing some research, I learned that this game technically has a whole other version released on the PS2 that's entirely in third person. From what I could tell, it seems to be the same game, just now the camera is behind you. If the Machin X wiki has anything to trust, the change occurred because Japanese gamers got motion sickness, and because of this change, you can't jump over enemies to get behind them. Which, if you played Machin X on the Dreamcast, you'll understand how important this is, because this is usually done to set up chances for critical hits on enemies, so I'm not sure how much that affected this version for that. The Japanese version had a bunch of enemies with swastikas on it that were removed from the American version, so good choice on that. The cool part about Machin, this was the first 3D game Atlas made, and it really isn't that bad for their first attempt. I found this interview, and it said that it was being made alongside Persona 2, and Kazuma Kaneko said he didn't even like it at first, and it felt like an odd job to him to even work on, but then he had a huge chain towards the game, and it became a goal to make it as good as they could. Kaneko even mentioned how after development ended, he was so worried about other devs making something more impressive that it would outshine their work in the future. He said he even found it frustrating to think about a lot. There's also tons of adverts showing off the game, and if there's again one thing Atlas nails every time, it's the 2D art because these are just downright beautiful. While searching, I even found a guidebook for the game, but I didn't buy this one because it wouldn't have gotten here on time for the release of this video, so these pictures from the eBay listing will have to do. From inside the guidebook, we get insight into our main character we will be seeing soon, and how her job is a high school student. Damn, that's crazy. She's over here getting paid for her high school years, while for me, I just got trauma. But enough going over the adverts and all that, it's time to dive into the game and learn what Atlas was making for those seven people who owned the Dreamcast. So good job on those seven fucking people. Woo! Mark and X! Atlas decided to make a first person game involving a lot of close combat mechanics with a fun twist. While playing through the story, you'll get the ability to start to brain jack people, allowing you to take over certain enemies and become them. With some being way better than others. Think of it like a darker version of Mario Odyssey. But, you know, actually good! <laughs> There's quite a lot of characters to find here, and each of them will play vastly different for the most part. My favorite was this guy who can just summon a giant lightning strike down even if you're far away, so while broken, it's still so fun to use. But while you may play as new characters, the combat still will boil down to the same ideas. Approach enemy and hit them till they die, while blocking and dodging when needed. The use of multiple characters does make the game feel fresh, even with the combat ideas still being the same. You will also come across a good amount of enemies through your journey, from other sword wielders to rocket launcher guys with bears on their chest, or even Silent Hill inspired monsters. But even with all these enemies, the way to deal with them still ends the same way with slashes and dodging. But there is another move every character has, and it's the charge move. By charging, you can let out a stronger attack at the cost of some of your health. Some characters' attacks aren't worth the sacrifice in health, while others are. You also have a great block in this game, and somehow it's the same idea as Kawhi Dan, where you hold back on the control stick and will block when an enemy swipes at you. Also cool fact, this was supposed to come out after Kawhi Dan, so if you don't know what Kawhi Dan is because I'm referencing it, that's why. Uh, go watch this video. But unlike Kawhi Dan, this game has a better execution for the mechanic. It probably comes down to how aggressive enemies are in this game, with how they try to swarm you and multiple can attack at once. Which in return, because of this aggression, there's less time spent recovering space that you made, and now more time gets spent reacting around the enemies taking away the space that you made. 
As the more I played though, I did start to get the mindset of how worthless these fights actually felt. I just started to feel annoyed about fighting random enemies in the stage that were at times quite bullshit to deal with. It got to the point that I just started to skip fights because I wanted to save my health for the enemies who are required to fight or the bosses. But I didn't know this at first, Machin has a mechanic that makes fighting pretty important at least for 80% of the game. The ranking system that's up here is what will decide if you can brain jack people or not. Which some of the people that you can brain jack are actually required to get so you can make progress in the story. The only way to raise your level is picking up these orbs that are in the stage or drop by enemies when they're defeated. So don't be like me and just ignore fights for most of the game. Or if you're daring, you can always grind a max level at the start of the game and then just breeze through the rest of it. So I mean that's always an option. Now it's time to talk about the enemies, and while some are challenging and fair to deal with while learning their patterns, some of them, like these weird worm creatures who move so fast and multiple can come at you at once, just start to feel like bullshit after a while. The worms can easily get out of your line of sight, causing you to miss them and get hit in return, and depending on what character you have brain jacked, get ready to die really fast as they all have different stats. I would say my least favorite combat encounter was with these mannequin guys as they put two against you and they have massive attacks that are quite fast with a huge amount of damage to boot behind those swings. They also don't stagger as easy, so be ready to dodge instantly out of combos. One by themselves isn't really an issue, as you can just dodge around them and block whenever necessary, but throwing two of these after you beat one is a nightmare. Then you have these ladies in blue who can just outright dodge during the middle of your combo, and with such long reach, you're going to get hit. And there's this level in the game where it makes you fight multiple waves of these enemy types, and since enemies will attack you together, get ready to get hit over and over. The best method I found to deal with these enemies is a character you get later on at the end of the game that has such a fast attack you can basically stun lock them and it makes them so quick to kill. But I'll talk more about him later on. I think now it's time to cover the story and what the hell is even going on in this game. Machin starts off with us being in a lab with a bunch of scientists talking about what to name something as they argue about how since it's alive they should be able to give it a proper name. And then one of them just says let Machin decide and then we're shown a name screen with this handsome thing in the background. We name the thing and then the scientists continue to talk more till these two show up. This is our first introduction to our main protag as she asks about Machin's awakening. Two of the scientists gossip about us being here and then we cut to this man walking up to them and says the chief wanted us to see everything. We get more detail about Machin and how we're planning to give it a mind of its own as the body is alive with nothing going on inside. I guess you could say it's a typical League of Legends player. We plan to achieve this by inserting Psy of a human into his brain, which should in return help Machin build its own world of Psy to then have free will. This is when we see the guy named Faye start to walk over to Machin as a scientist tells us he has the gene to wake Machin up, so he needs to get a closer look. Our protag goes down to talk to Faye, asking if he's scared by this encounter. Faye assures us our father knows what he's doing. Science jargon happens as we see Machin form into a sword. Then an explosion is heard as this guard shows it spitting knives out of its mouth and attacking anyone in its way. In the commotion of everything, her father gets kidnapped and Faye gets stabbed by knives all over his back as Kate cries for like three seconds over him. No! She then grabs a sword and fuses with Machin, causing the start of our adventure. All we know from here is some army is attacking the base and it's up to us to take them out. We soon run into the guy who took our dad and take him out in this epic boss fight of him running towards me over and over... And uh, yeah, that's it. Also, don't know what was wrong with my emulator, but my boss music always sounded like this. Since we're at the first boss, I want to add more about them. While not every boss in the game is a winner, I can't deny that I don't love the 1v1 fights with the more humanoid characters that feel like they're on the same level as you. Plus, being able to control the boss you just beat always feels like a nice reward for overcoming the fight. I just wish this horse boss didn't exist that we will run into later because boy do I not like the horse boss. We beat this guy pretty easily and then see our dad being carried off in a helicopter with some strange masked man who has the worst fashion choices ever. We cut back to Kay lying on a bed in the lab area as scientists are surprised how easily we formed with Machin as now both of our minds coexist in Machin's brain. Think of it like Sora and Roxas and how they're technically two people inside one person. Machin, after fusing with her, gained full control of Kay's body while Kay is just kind of inside in this weird mind dungeon. The scientists basically mention how at this point only the chief can save Kay as there's no way they can revert the process. If they don't fix it soon, she will be inside Machin's mind forever. We soon get interrupted by a call from Mr. Lee who learns Machin is now awake. They ask Mr. Lee to explain why Machin was created and why Kay's dad was kidnapped. 
Mr. Lee, at first not wanting to really divulge such information, but soon gives in, explains how Makin has godlike powers, letting him destroy people's minds in a psi world. They made him since Makin would be a key part of their plan. Lee says they needed Makin to destroy them, and them are supposed to be the people who would just lead the world to demise. They don't really go into full detail on that. Then Lee says how this is all from the work of one mind, the devil. Then goes on a whole tangent about poverty and disasters while telling us there's a plan to use China and the US to start World War III. And hearing this, this ends up being quite disturbing with how this gets pretty close to some thought processes people are having now about World War III. And again, this game was made in 1999. Then we're told if we don't stop this one person, the world will end. The scientists now learning Machin is a weapon of mass destruction aren't happy, but Machin wakes up and Lee tells him that they made him for one thing and he needs to do it while trying to get Kay's father back. We get the option to say yes or no here, and if you say no, not much really happens, but you do get the option. Kay will just come through and say she will go save her father even if you say no. So no matter what, you have to do it. Then they bring that guy we beat up before and we learn about brain jacking, so we proceed to brain jack him. Atlas, you could have, you know, picked way better names for this. Come on, dude. I think it's kind of ironic that Kay is a big part of the marketing for this game, and you play as her for only one stage. And while technically, yes, yeah, she is with you throughout the story, you only ever have to play as her one time. We're now tasked to go through China to get to Russia, but we need to find Faye's sister in Hong Kong along the way. We set off in this weird looking plane, and we soon get our first introduction to the Psy Dimension. And this is where Kay will be. She'll give weird long speeches to us or react to our actions in the story. That's all she really does, so get used to that. You also get asked questions at times, and this apparently will give you an extra small scene at the end, depending on how you answer them. If it wasn't for these scenes, I would completely forget she was even part of the game. We learn she's 16 and in high school with a dead mother. And trust me, this part will be important later. Uh, the uh, dead mother part, not the high school part. While flying, we notice a plane grabs onto ours and boards it. This is when we learn this was a trap as a flight intended tells us this. You have our thanks for flying the deadly skies and, by the way, prepare to die. How could you be so daft? Of course this is a trap! We beat all the enemies and then bring Jack one of the workers on the plane, and this allows us to fly out of here with an escape plane. So during some levels, we'll sometimes cut back to the scientists that will just have these two talking about characters in the game or learning more info about the world. This time we learn how Kay's own father was experimenting on her because she has the D gene. But this is kind of the only really important stuff said here, so we'll move on. We're now in Hong Kong, and we run into Faye's sister as she tells us she has a mission for us to go deal with Shaja. Apparently, he's sending radio waves to seal people's souls. Then Kay just straight up says how she doesn't want to go to India, and she's here to save her father. We then say no and kill Faye's sister and steal her body to Brain Jack. Kay seemed to not like this choice and is angry now, even though our only other option was to go to India. So I think I made the right choice. Why'd you kill Faye Sean? There was no need to kill her. Was it her attitude? My father didn't make you just so you could kill people. And for what it seems like, no one really gives a shit. I mean, we run into this Blade Master who knows we killed her and basically just says I had my reasons for it and we move on. So this is Kitty. She's one of the Blade Masters and we're tasked to follow her to Kay's father. We fade to black and are now back with the scientists who are watching some guy talk about cult stuff and killing yourself for a new awakening. Basically just another Tuesday for cults. Then the two scientists learn that Kay's father has been sending all of his data to Dr. Guinness. Apparently Dr. Guinness was always against this whole experiment ever happening, but with that good news, we now have bad news as we learn about human experimentation going on, and with the game telling us this is bad news, you think they would really, you know, kind of go into more detail about it, but they don't. And now we learn about the reality of Kay's situation, as it's very grim. If we don't find a way to unfuse Kay for Machin, Machin will absorb Kay's sigh and make her a vegetable, as everything that makes her her will be gone. They decided they need to tell Machin to go see Dr. Guinness in Europe, and apparently a plug is going on there as well. You know, a very European move indeed. And I guess now I can use this time to talk about Ko real quick. This guy is just the definition of a whiny bastard. He's always just screaming, what should we do with saving K without really giving any ideas? Man was ready to go to Europe for someone who may or may not even be there, so props to him for being a huge simp for K. And I don't know what was going on when they were recording his voice lines for the game, but he sounds like he's reading his lines away from the mic, and he just kept it in. Kind of just sounds like this, being read from far away. No, no way! We've got to do something about this! And I kind of wish there was more I could say about Ko, but that's really all there is to him. He's always screaming about K or just what we could do to save her without actually providing anything to help save her. So I don't like him as a character at all. He just comes off as really annoying. 
Now cutting back to Makin and Kay, we get shown her father, but he's not responding as we get told by Kitty, his soul was taken. Geist is apparently the guy who took her father's soul. We also learn that Geist is apparently not even human, but has been serving this planet for a long time, and he's now decided that he wants to kill all humans and take over the world. Kitty explains to us how he can steal people's sire, put part of his into someone else's, and take control over them. Which sounds a lot like Makin. We're now tasked with just going through the stages, trying to learn where Geist is while trying to find the Blade Masters. Now this is the part of the story where you have to find the Blade Masters in the stages and they're quite hidden. And the reason why you have to find some of the Blade Masters is because only some of them can help you get through the story because they have a third ability like being able to open certain doors or being required to even get to a boss fight. I'll give some props to the game because it does make it a little easier to try to find which maps have a Blade Master because if they do, they'll have this glowing thing around the map. So thank God for that. One of the first Blade Masters we find is Tyrus, and he's one of my favorites as he's the guy who could shoot lightning from the sky. Tyrus lets us know that Kitty said to be all Geist's allies in Europe and they go to Lisbon. He then says how Geist is trying to kill all humans as it's up to the Blade Masters to stop it from happening. This is when we learn about the Blade Master sacrifices they all had to make to help save everyone, as one sacrificed the time with someone they love, and the other couldn't even watch her own children grow. This is when we learn that Kay's own mother was a Blade Master before Kay was even born. He finishes off asking Machin will he kill or save the human race. After telling Yes that will save the human race, he tells us to go find Don Regalia and defeat him, but before we can even get to him, we have to go find another person named Samuel Smith as he should know where the Don is hiding. We take over Tyrus and now we can use him in battle. We cut back to Kay as she's not sure how to feel about her mother being a Blade Master, as she now learned her mom was still alive after she gave birth, and this makes her feel sad that she chose duty over family. Then Kay starts to have a coughing fit showing early signs of her mind failing. Once she finishes coughing, she then asks us if we can work hard to create our own happiness. We say yes and move on. We're now in Amsterdam and find this underground club as the next Blade Master here is Devin. He tells us how he has little faith that a replica of Geis will be able to stop Geis from taking over the world, but he has no choice but to rely on you. He then goes on about how he had to let go of the ones he loved to become a Blade Master and serve his duty. He then demands us that we need to go beat Geist's people and then lets us brain jack him. And man, I'm really not a fan when the characters ask you to do this. Makin, you have no choice. You must brain jack me. Oh, hell no, man. What the fuck, man? Get your ass on. We can now use Devin to go fight one of the story bosses, his ex. Kay talks to the more while still coughing and she finds it's tragic to fight against someone he loved. Then she asks us if I wish I was a human instead of a machine. We say yes and then she gets all happy. We're now ready to take on Devin's ex. She's quite crazy and she wants the death of the human race and then breaks up with Devin and then asks if they can still find a way to work something out. This boss fight sucks man. You're fighting this giant metal warhorse who does so much damage with its attacks and it's also huge not giving you enough space to even get around it faster. The best strat is to go behind it and try to follow its turning while swiping at it. Once you take it down though, the real fight happens as this is also horrible. She will never stop running and will shoot these projectiles that can bounce off walls. I couldn't imagine beating this without save states because if you die to her, you have to do the whole fight over again. Real quick though, I want to give Machin some props here with how it displays enemy health bars. When you target onto an enemy, you see this red ring as this represents how much health they still have while fitting right in with the UI elements of the lock-on. It's very well made and at all times you're always knowing how much health the boss has without having to look away from the actual boss, so it's a very nice touch. We take her out and then can brain jack her, back with Kay inside the side dungeon and she says how she's surprised to see how much that lady really loved Devin, even though she tried to kill him and broke up with him before doing so. Kay then asks if I could fight someone I really loved and my response made her speechless. Now we're in London and this sure is a good depiction of it. I feel like a bugger is going to come and stab me any second. Once we beat that stage, we run into this guy who's decked out in roses. I really love this guy's design a lot. He, however, talks about cult stuff and how it's okay for people to die so they can be saved, so that's gonna get some points off for me. The fight can be a little annoying because if you fall off the ring at any point, you're basically dead, and he sure loves trying to knock you off of it. Once you can figure out how to stay behind him and farm crits, he goes down pretty easily. But, because I didn't do a bunch of fights during the stages, we're not able to brain jack him just yet, as I'm too low of a rank from skipping a lot of the fights. So we have to move on. Kay is back talking about pursuing power could bring misery if not careful, but she needs power to save her father and asks if it's wrong for wanting this. We tell her no and she thinks us. This next stage can eat a dick as it has these planes that are fast and they explode on contact. There's even this segment where they seem to move at random and they can change their placement at the last second and you have to get past them to progress. While I think Machin X comes off really strong with the earlier levels, I think it takes a huge nosedive in the later parts as enemies become more annoying to deal with, and they just start throwing multiple enemy encounters back to back. 
It starts to end up feeling like luck at times to not get hit instead of actual skill from the player. And turns out in the interview I referenced at the start, the devs apparently designed the game to have a huge emphasis on trial and error, so this cheap feeling is apparently a game design that they chose to do. While I get what they're going for, it ends up being really annoying more than anything since dying means you replay the whole stage again instead of, you know, continuing from like a checkpoint. Plus, mix this with the whole quest of finding the Blade Masters, it ends up being very tedious as a lot of them are hidden extremely well. This is why I would recommend a guide to find them as it will save you so much time since you have to replay the stage again if you miss them the first time. While making a lot of progress, we finally level up enough and can now brainjack the last guy we fought. We're now at Jane de Arc's palace and this whole mission is just full of the mannequin nightmares and multiple fights in a row with more than one of them at a time. And I already said why this segment ends up sucking, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on. We run into this weird demon looking guy, and it ends up being the guy from the footage the scientist saw. He then tells us how we need to purify ourselves and that those are the types of people God would want as followers. He adds on to how guys can only save us, but since we wanted to betray them, he can't promise a forever after for us anymore. Now this guy can be cheesed pretty easily if you know what you're doing, as his rush attacks can be dodged and countered, but I could do without the summoning of those mannequin enemies. Usually when a boss has to summon enemies like this mid-fight, it means the devs didn't think this boss was interesting enough to carry it on its own, so I just kind of feel like this is just more padding for no reason. We finally beat him and still can't bring Jack him because of our level. Hey look, Kay again talking about stuff. She basically says how no one can judge what good and evil really are and then adds how she has to believe in herself. Her question this time is about our regrets with the battles we fought so far. We tell her no, and we soon run into another blade master as it's the girl with the drill on her hand. This is Elise, who seems to have a weird issue with her hand staying connected to her wrist. She asks Maka how he sees the world, and is it different from how humans view it? And not a lot really happens with that, and I just kind of realize how many characters just ask you random shit, and nothing ever really follows through with it. And now we get some insight about the plague that's been spreading around, as it's from one of Geist's members doing it. Then Elise mentions how we need to go find a pathologist named Dahl, but as of now only his daughter Bianca knows where he is, but she ran away and is now infected with the plague and was sent to the hospital in room 503. So guess we're heading there to brain jack a sick patient. A blade master who'll never get to see her children grow. Dude, come on Kay, I don't care to hear about your mommy issues. Now in Instable, we come here to find this weird TV guy who talks like someone doing a fake Sonic voice, but it makes sense when you learned Ryan Drummond voices characters in the game. Now I couldn't find who he voices specifically, but I'm 99% positive this is Ryan here. Well, you are a copy of Geist. The Great Geist, I guess it is to be expected. Also joining us again is Steve Brody and Mark Biaggi, so it's crazy to see how much they work together after the Sonic game still. So this fight has a gimmick to it where you have to stop these clocks so you can get up to fight them, or at least that's what I thought since he just came down to fight anyways randomly. But we win and then brain jack him and can now use them in battle. Now it's pretty crazy just how good this guy ends up being mostly because his attacks come out so fast you can almost stunlock some of the fastest enemies in the game making once annoying enemies as mentioned before become trivial. We run into Kitty and Ko as he actually came here, surprisingly. Kitty then tells us how we need to go to Arabia to get some important information from Yusuf. Ko then tells us how we gotta return K because she will die. If you try to say yes to go back to the lab, K will just tell you not to and to use her powers to save everyone, so I don't even know why they even gave you the option to say yes or no. Now we're back at the lab as they talk about how the US is going to take sanctions against China because they're trying to monopolize oil resources. Plus an attack of the president was attempted just a normal Tuesday, you know. So now both countries aren't willing to compromise, meaning World War 3 is soon upon us. Then the power goes out, we will learn the mainland power station is down. The government apparently stopped the power grid as a sign of the war starting. We are now in Arabia and run into this freak of nature. He goes on to question us why we can't understand their ideas that they're doing and we just let other people control us instead. We just end up beating his ass so who cares. This guy has a very interesting design and it's probably one of my favorites in the whole game. Having the spinning cloak around his neck hiding the gruesome meat flesh thing under it. Another trippy design from Atlas as usual and I think that's why I like it so much because it really feels like it should be in a horror game instead of you know this. We beat the boss as usual and take him out and now we make it to Brazil, ja ja. This is probably one of the most unique looking stages out of everything but feels pretty pointless to come here. Once you finish the stage we get a shot of Ko and some old guy as they now have Machin. We learn K is getting weaker now and will soon perish so the only option we could think of is a reverse brain jack but we need K's body to do it. But with all the airways now shut down thanks to the start of World War 3 it's next to impossible. Ko then acts like he's the main character talking about beating Geist himself. Man code, just shut the fuck up, dude. I hate this guy so much, man. Then I must defeat Geist myself. 
so Chief Sagami can help save Kay. Whatever happened to predictability? The milkman, the paperboy, the evening TV. Well, with the last person we need to fight being in Washington, D.C., I don't know why I was somehow surprised. The boss here is a stereotypical idea of a president fighting in a giant ass robot. While this robot may look threatening, he ends up being pretty easy to beat. Then the second phase happens and he's now trying whatever he can to still take you out. This fight is still pretty easy once you learn the patterns, but I do like it a lot. Just get him to throw himself into an electric fence as it's the only way to get him to drop his shield down and then wail on him. After beating the stereotypical American dictator, we're now in the final area of the game. And man, as much as I praise this game for being amazing graphically, there's not a single thing in this game that would have prepared me for how trippy this last area gets. We go through these temples fighting these amazing design enemies based on parade dragons, and we soon make it to this main temple as we go deeper and deeper down into it till we come across the trippiest level I've ever seen. It would be an understatement to say that this ending area really blew me away and I can't imagine how long this took them to make. There's just so much going on here visually. I think this is a perfect example of how otherworldly Alice can get at times. We follow this path all the way to the temple at the end of the stage and we soon will come face to face with Geist. So if you didn't go to India at the start of the game, this is when you will run into the guy you were supposed to fight there and it really shows he was an early fight indeed as he's probably one of the easiest things you'll come across to the point that he's even easier than just normal enemies now. After that, it's now a path up to the building with the bright white light surrounding it. We head into the light ready to face the end boss. Guys here while looking like a goat really has a nice design that I enjoyed and the boss room really rivals the Majora's Mask boss room with how trippy and creative it is. Guys tells us that if we try to fight him, K will surely die making it where we can't fight unless we want to lose K. But he gives us another offer. Because Guys has Sagami's knowledge to save K after he stole his Sai and he says if we accept his offer, we can go ahead and leave here with that knowledge for ourselves. But if we say no, then it's time to fight. So if you accept this offer, an ending will play where Kay is saved, but then she hates you for doing it. She's basically mad that we didn't save her dad and how it's not possible for a machine to care. But if you say no, a really fun and crazy fight commences, and man, does he feel like a threat. You really need to fully understand the game's combat system or guys will make quick work of you. And since he's fast, he can move around quite a lot and you have to have good reaction time to deal with him. But with Geist being no match to us, we take him down to then see the true form of Geist. A giant lizard demon holding a crystal ball. I'll be honest, this part here, I had no idea how to fight him and this seemed to be an issue a lot of people faced. But what you're supposed to do is hit these shots back into these crystals getting rid of them. And once done, you can now actually damage guys as he comes low enough to hit. But even with them coming down low enough, it's still hard to hit him as only the green ball can be damaged. We then get the final blow to Geist and destroy his reign of terror once and for all. We watch Geist disappear into a giant flash of white. Only thing left now is a sword he once held, but it soon crumbles and fades away. We then come back to Kay as she dies because we used too much of her energy. We're now with the science team as the war seems to end as Machin is now back as Ko is excited to see Kay. But her dad then meets us by the sword that started it all, as he knows. That's not K. As K is dead. We end off on some sweet jazz music and while there's multiple endings, they're not really that interesting enough to justify another playthrough. While I personally like a lot of aspects to Machin, I will say this game pulls no punches near the end and without save states, I'm sure I would have just given up eventually because it really just felt so annoying to keep pushing through enemies that were just waves and waves of them. If I could give any advice, it would be to really learn the controls, knowing the controls will help deal with a lot of these annoying parts as you will have a better understanding when to block an attack. But yeah, that's Machin. A first attempt at 3D from Atlas that I felt did well enough for sure. Still no funny the fish levels of quality though. But I'll see you guys later. Let's hope this whole November part of 61 Days of Spook goes really well because I had a lot of fun in October.